Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known, made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. Greetings again, my saints and friends, those of you who are present, those who are watching the broadcast, and welcome to this, our third Sunday in Advent, denoted by the lighting of the pink candle this morning, which is the candle of joy. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for prayer as Reverend Brendan McCormick shall come and lead us in a word of prayer. Good morning and praise God this morning. Yeah. It's a beautiful day to be here. Yeah. But we have so much to be thankful for. And I asked you as you bow your heads in prayer this morning. Because God spared our lives. Our Lord. But there's so many in this country today who lost their lives over the last few days in storms. So many families are grieving. So many hearts are broken. And let us just remember them as we not only pray today, but let's just remember them and see what we as a people, as a Christian people, can do to help them. Let us pray. God our Father, we come to you in this on this third Advent Sunday, expecting your arrival, mm -hmm. but knowing that you're already here. Yes. Expecting a miracle but knowing that you have already been a miracle. Lord. So God, we just say thank you this thank morning. You, we say thank you for just waking us up. Thank you for allowing us to be able to come into your church house once again. Whether or not we are here physically, whether we are virtually, whether we're on a telephone call, but God, we're here. We're here to worship you. We're here to praise you. Yeah. We're here to honor you. We're here to give you glory. Yeah. And we just say thank you. Yeah. Father, there's so much that has happened in this world over the last week since we met. But we know, God, that no matter what has happened, oh, you're Lord. still in control. Yeah. But God, we can't even begin without lifting up those people in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. People who were, some who were asleep, some who were going about their daily tasks, and yet now they're no longer here. So many families are grieving, oh God, and we just pray, oh God, that you would just comfort them. But we know, oh God, that there are things that we can do. So would you open our eyes and open our hearts, and yes, Lord, even open our pocketbooks so that we may be able to help our neighbor. Because you said that when we do it to the least of them, yeah. we do it unto you. Yeah. So God, don't let us all be about so much about us for this holiday. But let us be about doing things that will please you by helping others. God, we pray for St. Mark AME Zion Church. We sat on this hill for an awful long time. And God, we just want to continue to be a beacon light. A light where people know that they can come and be safe. A light where people can know that they can come and follow our star just as the wise men followed your star. And that when they come, they'll find you here. Because they will find people who love you, people who praise you, people who honor you. Yeah. Help us, oh God, to reach out into this community yeah. and do what we can do to help our neighbors. Help, oh God, those who are being besieged by violence. Help our young men and our young women to come to know you. Yeah. Lord, what better season of the year than this one mm -hmm. to reach out? And so, God, we just say thank you. thank you. We pray for the sick among us, and there are many. I can't call all their names that I want, but we will lift up one. We'll lift up Jeanette Thorpe, oh God. She's been in the hospital. She's out of the hospital now, but she has a long road ahead. So we ask that you would just touch her, oh God. Yeah. Heal her body.
Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Jesus is real. Yes. The song says, I can feel him in my hands. I can feel him in my feet. Yes, Lord. Is that right? Yes, Lord. And then I can feel him where? <laughs> that Jesus is real. And don't be getting mad with folk who say he ain't. Maybe for them he ain't. But for me, Jesus is real. Amen. Amen. Thank you, choir. I can always hear that one. Mm -hmm. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given. Thank you, St. Mark, for the tithe and offerings, the gifts that you give to keep this Amen. ministry on this Sunday. Every day ought to be a day of joy. Amen. But this is a reminder to um, let the joy bells ring mm -hmm. and continue to ring in your life. Let me announce, also announce, a word of thanks to the Christian Education Department for the movie that we went uh together as a group to watch the um, King Richard movie. It was a it's a great show for those who haven't seen it. It's a good mm -hmm. historical movie about black history in America. Mm -hmm. Venus and Serena Williams, their life and how their father was such an instrumental part of their success. Thank you, Christian Ed, for that, for that outing and for all of those who came. And if you saw us on Facebook, it was a whole gang of us. I didn't realize it was so many until I looked at the picture. The gang of us, thank you. I also, um, in the same spirit of the Christian Ed Department, want to announce and ask you, church, to let us plan to join the St. Mark CED, Christian Education Department, the uh, specifically the children and youth department on next Sunday, that's December the 19th, at 9 o'clock a.m. right here. So if you're watching me now, wherever you are, go ahead and be here in that same place next Sunday at 9 a.m., 9 a.m., mm -hmm. for the annual Christmas program, which will be sponsored by Christian Ed, Children and Youth, all right? That'll be, in other words, another way to say it is, is it will happen before the 10 a.m. worship for those of you who join us by Facebook or on the phone call. It will start before the 10 o'clock worship at 9 a.m. and then we will go right into the 10 a.m. worship right after that. So make yourself some extra coffee mm -hmm. and uh, come on and be with us next Sunday. I think that's all the announcements that I need to reiterate at this time. And um, with that being said, I'm going to ask this good sounding choir to come back and give us another selection, which is the selection of preparation. Pray for me as I come and share with you from the Word of God. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Sorry. Yeah, you don't know I'm getting up in age. Joe, do you have an announcement? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hope, peace, joy, and love. The season of expectation as we continue to enjoy the blessings of the Advent, reflecting on how we prepare our hearts and homes 
to commemorate the birth of Jesus, the sacred meaning of Christmas, one of the holiest times in the Christian faith. Greetings to each of you, our St. Mark AME Zion Church family on the various viewing platforms and all of our special visitors and friends who have joined us virtually or by telephone in worship. Yes, we are physically distant, but spiritually present to receive what God has in store for each of us who diligently seek him. This responsibility afforded me, for which I am grateful, to share with each of you how we can be a seasonal blessing to our esteemed pastor and his family during this Christmas season. We all agree our St. Mark senior pastor is a man of great and unquestionable character, wonderful temperament, and one who possesses a splendid reputation for integrity, honesty, and loyalty, providing quality spiritual leadership and sacrificial dedication during these unprecedented times. It is because of these few traits, among others, we are asking you to remember this ministry team of Reverend and Mrs. Julian C. Pridgen during this holiday by blessing them with gifts of love. Normally, the pastor's aide and stewardess board would have an eloquently de decorated holiday receptacle here in the sanctuary, and I think there is one here, to receive your gifts. But we are asking you to bring your special gifts to the church following all of the guidelines for safety we have instituted here at St. Mark. Please observe the modified church office hours, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 12 noon until 4 p.m., where Ms. LaQuinta Parker Perry, the church secretary, will assist you. St. Mark, you have always risen to the occasion and demonstrated warm-hearted humanity for its leadership whenever requested. As we think of our senior pastor and how he shepherds the flock, God does not call the equipped, he equips the call. Thanks in advance for what you will do to share the gifts of faith filled with his love and the blessings of hope wrapped with his peace. May God grant you the light in Christmas, which is faith, the warmth of Christmas, which is love, the radiance of Christmas, which is purity, the righteousness of Christmas, which is justice, the belief in Christmas, which is truth, the all of Christmas, which is Christ. May the joyful spirit that permeates the air remain with you well into the new year with peace, power, and abundant blessings. We will be counting on you with your special gifts. Thank you.
Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lord, we thank you again from the bottoms of our hearts and from the depths of our souls for this opportunity to be here and to worship you. And as the choir says, we're going to tell the story one day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. How we made it over. Help me now to preach a sermon that will help us until we make it over. A sermon that is more than good, but one that will do us some good. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Before I take my text, let me, um, an announcement came to me afterwards that is important and um, I need to make it now. The also, the church school will be giving out Christmas gifts, bags, on the church parking lot this coming Saturday at 12 noon. All right? So help spread the word. <clears throat> From the aforementioned passage of Scripture, you heard me read earlier, from Philippians chapter 4, I read from verse 1 down through verse 7. I want to re speak, re announce rather, that very first verse, verse number 4, believed to have been written by Paul as he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Mm -hmm. Amen. And again, I say rejoice. From that sentence, I want to speak from the subject topic, the joy agenda. Mm -hmm. The joy agenda. Paul's joy agenda. <coughs> Welcome my sisters and brothers to the book of Philippians and specifically Philippians chapter four. This book and chapter functions like a well-chosen send-off or final effort to emphasize what is healthy for the church body and that the words remind the congregation what the worship, including its sermon, was all about. Mm -hmm. These words provide Practical advice to the members of the church as this missionary preacher tells the church folk and culture to rejoice in the Lord always. Mm -hmm. Paul says to his audience, present and future, Rejoice in the Lord always again, I say, rejoice. Mm -hmm. In my humble opinion, this sentence alone captures what could be made two key elements to Paul's letter to the church. First, joy. And secondly, focus on that joy which is implied as the verse reads, again, mm -hmm. I say rejoice. Yeah. Come on, people. Paul says rejoice. And then in the same breath, mm -hmm. he says, again, I say rejoice. Now relative to these two elements, rejoice and then focus on rejoicing, to say that joy is a main ingredient to the Christian church and specific to the passage, Paul uses the word rejoice in the verse, which is defined as having great joy. Mm -hmm. Great joy, not just regular joy, but great joy. But then focus is equally important because it is without doubt that it takes focus in such a distracting world to find joy 
And it takes focus to hold to the joy when you find it. Mm -hmm. I, I hope y'all get that. In this, in this world that is loaded with so many things to steal your joy. Mm -hmm. You'd be sitting in church or in a good place enjoying the presence of your joy and something can steal it. So focus is important because focus in this, in my presentation, wants to say that we have to focus to get it in this particular world, context and world, and you have to focus to hold on to the joy when you find it. Hope I'm starting out all right. Yes, sir. And so as we proceed in considering Paul's words from this particular passage, let me remind you that the Apostle Paul is considered a master at rhetoric. Mm. A fancy way of saying that Paul is very good at persuasive speech. Mm. Uh -huh. And a technique that Paul uses to persuade is repetition. That is, repeating the same things over again. Mm. In this particular passage, Paul has simply repeated, almost verbatim, what he had already stated in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. And he says, Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. At close inspection of the text, you can see for yourself that Paul even admits repeating verse when he says but to write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous but for you it is safe come on, come on. he's admitting that he's repeating the same things over and over again mm -hmm. also as I talk about Paul pushing this joy agenda you ought to know that Paul opens this letter to the Philippians mm -hmm. with remarks that he is constantly praying with joy. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 4, he goes on to talk about his rhetorical way of convincing. He goes on to talk about having joy in faith, found in Philippians chapter 1, verse 25. He wants the Philippians to make his joy complete by having the same intent and mind, which he states in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. In chapter 4, this that I have presented to you today, Paul calls the congregation in Philippi, my joy and crown, wanting them to understand that they give him delight. So then one can conclude that Paul's list of comments related to joy show that joy is a central theme. It's a central idea for Paul. Come on, yeah. And Paul believes that it is a central theme for the Christian church. But also when Paul talks about joy, I don't think that he's talking about a few friends getting together and having some laughs. Yeah. Laughter may or may not be included in Paul's concept of joy, but here Paul talks about something that could be referred to as emotion, yet it is something that is deeper and a little more complex mm -hmm. than some kind of emotional experience. Oh, yeah. I dare not say that joy doesn't involve one's emotions, but joy in Paul's understanding, or I believe, is something more than a superficial emotional experience mm -hmm. that moves you for a while 
and then leaves you after a while. Come on and preach. It is believed that Paul writes this letter when he is, listen to me, good. He's writing to the, to the Philippians when he is a prisoner himself. That's right. Bound in chains. And he's writing to those, or those who are receiving this letter, are also living in hardship. Therefore, for the Christian, joy is not the result of an easy life without difficulties. Mm -hmm. No, no. Come on. Or of one's current circumstances or state of mind, but a deep and constant attitude that is born of faith in Christ Jesus. Come on, preacher. That's what joy is. First John chapter one, verse three and four says, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Yes. Did y'all hear that? Yes, sir. It's as if Paul is implying that joy cannot be full, complete, outside <coughs> of a relationship with the Father and with Jesus Christ, his son. In other words, Paul, along with other New Testament writers, is talking about a joy that has God at the center. Not the multitude of things in life that we try to squeeze joy out of. I always look side-eyed at Christian folk who come up with these different things in their life mm. and say that that particular one, that particular thing is my life, mm -hmm. my joy, yeah. my world. Mm -hmm. I've heard, don't y'all get mad with me. Mm -hmm. I've heard people show pictures of their grandbabies mm -hmm. and yeah. say that's my life pictures of their own children and say that's my pride and joy yeah. well grandbabies will get on your nerve yeah. children will leave you yeah. and I'm here to suggest to you that if that's your joy then some sad times are on the way and so Paul is trying to help us by saying that you need in the center of your life. It's all right to have these other things that might add to your joy. Come on, man. Did y'all hear me? Yes, sir. But Paul is saying to the church that at the very center of your life, the only way to have full and complete joy is to have the one who gives you life, sustains your life. And gives you life after life as you understand it. And that is God the creator. It is a belief that only God. What I'm saying is. is it, it, Paul believes that only God is a savior who can save. Only God is the one who will save. Only God is the one that we should put our trust in. To save us from all of the enemies of life. Mm. When I talk about and when scripture talks about the enemies of life, it ain't talking about Pookie and Ray Ray. <laughs> Shaquita and Bonquisha and all of them. That's, I'm not talking about all of them. But remember, the Bible talks about what's called uh, uh, all kinds of existential threats. Yeah. Enemies that may surround your life. Those seen, you can see bone quisha in them. But God protects us from those enemies, most importantly, that you can't see. I wish I could get a little help in here. <clears throat> Cancers and threats of death that float and hover in the air. Traveling mercies. You, you left home late and upset with yourself because you got out of the house late, but 
You get down the road of peace and there's an accident and an ambulance. And you realize that if you had been on time, you would have either been in the accident or the accident. Paul is saying that this one that you should put at the center of your life is the one that protects you from all of these enemies, both seen and unseen. And I'm careful with this. I know the implications behind it, but we've had a pandemic going on. And I've heard about so many people, more people dying than I've ever heard of in my life. But we're still here. God has graced us and blessed us to be, to be here. And it's by his grace, favor and love that we've made it from a kind of enemy that the Lord protects us from. And Paul is saying that you ought to acknowledge the fact that God has been in the center of your life. This God, this saving God has been there to save us from the enemies that would have done us harm. This joy that Paul mentions is based upon the belief that God has saved those who trust in him mm -hmm. in the past and God will save those who trust in him in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Paul's joy describes an appreciation for God in the present, but it also refers to a hope in God for the future. Yeah. And I think that Paul would tell us that Christian joy does not discount suffering. Oh. Preach, Reverend. Hold it right there, Reverend. Yes, sir. It, it doesn't discount suffering. Uh, you know, God uses suffering. God, let me put it this way, because so y'all get mad with me. God allows suffering to come into our lives to build our sense of joy. You know, some of us, we get so carried away with the good things of this world until we'll forget to tell the Lord, thank you. Thank you. If things got too good for too long, some of us would wake up in the morning and wouldn't say a prayer. But uh, I know this sounds weird, but uh, <laughs> uh, I won't even say it that way. But that arthritis that helps wake you up in the morning. It's the same kind of suffering that'll help you say thank you, Jesus. Because God allows suffering to help us learn to have joy, to help us recognize the joy that God gives. A Christian joy doesn't discount suffering, no, no. However, joy is not spoiled by suffering. Come on. I'm trying to help somebody now. Your, your joy ain't spoiled by the suffering. You know, we are a people who have in our rhetorical library the words, this too will pass. Yeah. Yeah. We understand that suffering doesn't last always, but it might be a necessary part to life on this side of heaven. Come on, good preaching, yes, sir. Joy does not does not spoil our, uh, it's not spoiled rather by suffering. So yes, this kind of joy, my brothers and sisters in my thinking, is an incubator that if we learn to embrace it, it keeps and carries us through sufferings my Lord. as our joy in God is a demonstration of the faith to believe that something new will be revealed yes. on the other side of our suffering. Come on, that's really the biblical story in a nutshell. Mm. That, that's really uh, Israel's story as they come out of slavery in Egypt. Mm. They're keeping their eyes on the Lord by the help of the Lord. And they're walking forward instead of sitting in pity was a demonstration of their faith to believe that something new will be revealed on the other side of their suffering. And after they made it through the wilderness, I know 
I'm off course, but I'm doing it intentionally. Israel learned that this God who saves is a God worthy of their praise and joy. And for those of us who know about oppression, for those of us who know about depression and destruction, for those of us who know something about being pressed down and troubled and in conflict, joy for us is an act of resistance to resist the forces of despair. I wish I could get a little more help. Yes, sir. There's some folk in this room listening to this broadcast. You said to yourself, I'm not going to let this get me down. Yes, sir. I, I, I know I'm going through something right now, but it won't be this way always. I'm not going to let this legitimate weight, this real, it ain't in my mind, it's real. <clears throat> this thing that I'm dealing with yeah. may be both Quisha and Shaquita and them, but I'm not going to let it get me down. And to refuse to go down, but embrace joy yeah. in the midst of your trials is an act of resistance against these forces of despair. But also, but also, this, this joy for us is something that we that we have to work at. Mm -hmm. I know some folks say, well, Reverend, what kind of preacher are you? Because can't we receive it by faith? And if it's something that God gives, why do we have to work at it? Well, if you ask me that question, I don't know what to tell you, but I do know to tell you this, joy is something that you got to work at. And let me tell you how I know. I know because I know. <laughs> yes, that joy is something that you got to work at, right. and if you learn to work at it, Come on. after a while, something that becomes a learned state of being, mm -hmm. and eventually it becomes a way of life. Yeah. To learn to have joy always, to learn to rejoice always, yeah. and I must admit. I must admit, to be totally transparent, I've been preaching for a long time now, but to be transparent about uh, this, I must admit that I wondered, is it necessary to have to, have to remind church folk to have joy? And, and uh, this ain't about St. Mark, I'm just talking, saying what I'm saying, but I've been preaching for 30 some odd years now, some of the meanest folk I've ever met, some of the most unhappy folk. Y'all pray for me. Some of the most hateful folk I've ever met in my life. I met them at church. Hmm. Lord have mercy. And so I'm sort of answering my own question before I even ask the question because I was going to admit, ask, why, ask the question of, is it necessary my Lord. to have to remind church folk <laughs> to have joy? Yes. Is it necessary for the preacher to have to remind the church the offsprings of a resurrected Christ, the Christ, the one who has overcome death, Three. Yes, sir. hell and the grave, right. the people who belong to that Christ, confess that Christ, is it necessary to have to remind folk to have joy? Stop fussing and fighting and arguing over the color of a carpet. Where the piano sits, who sit in your seat? Is it necessary to have to remind church? folk to have joy and, and after serving in pastoral ministry for all of these decades now I realize I really do that it is necessary for the preacher to remind the body and the body to remind the preacher Lord help mercy to realize and keep this Christian kind of joy at the center 
of your life. I, I, I'm convinced that if we can learn to keep this Christian kind of joy at the center of our lives, our churches would look much better. We could fill up every pew. Yeah, you may lose your seat. But in the name of Jesus and for the cause of Christ, we could fill the house if we can keep this Christian kind of joy at the center of our lives. We live in a world where bad news and the potentials of trouble constantly rise. And too often the bad news rises above the good. Yes. Preach, Reverend. Yes. In other words, let me break it down to you. Uh, <clears throat> after church on Sunday, folk are more apt to gossip about what happened that had nothing to do with the Lord than they are to praise oh. God about the good news yes. that was in the air. Yes. Are you with me? Uh, because we have a tendency right. to want to clean to the bad and the not so good. For while there, there may be good news and joyful things to think on all around us, we are by design a people who tend to be naturally inclined towards that which is not so good. Preach, Reverend, you're doing all right. So thank you, Reverend Paul. As you push the joy agenda, uh -huh. We need a periodic reminder yes. to rejoice yes. in the Lord, yes. to always rejoice in the Lord. And then there's this notion of learning to focus on joy. Mm -hmm. Be attentive to knowing joy. Yeah. Yeah. You, you gotta, you, you gotta have you got to be willing to pay attention to the joy that's around you. Mm -hmm. Because just like there's bad news, uh, there's also some good news. Yeah. Just like there's the potential for despair, there's also right alongside. It's just how life works. Right alongside is the potential for joy. Yeah. Uh, it is in my uh, early 50s, I, now I've learned, well, I'm mid 50s. I've learned, well, I'm actually late 50s. But I, I've learned that life is both and. It's always both and. Did y'all hear me? Yeah. That life is more both and than it is not. You got both. You know, we, we want to live in this world of perfection that will never happen. You want to create perfection in your own house and it never happen. You want to free your house of dust and make it clean, cleaner than anybody's house in the neighborhood and it never happen. There may be some clean spots. But don't look too close because there's some dust in the room somewhere. And you might as well get happy or, or, or get satisfied with or comfortable with the fact that we live in a both hand world. That's right. Just as sure as you got one thing going on, on the polar opposite, there's this other thing that's going on. And we have to have the faith, the sense enough to choose which one is the best representation of the God that we serve and who serves us. That's why Joshua says to Israel, choose you this day who you're going to serve. Because Joshua knows that we live in a both and world. This joy that Paul talks about, this joy, that agenda that he preaches, he's preaching it in a world where there's bad news and the potential for good news all at the same time. So I want to thank him for pushing this agenda to rejoice always. Because in this world that we live, this time in which we live, it takes focus to embrace this kingdom of God kind of joy. My Lord. A joy that is much different from the kind of joy that the world gives. Uh -huh. And 
And while this joy that Paul has in mind is not referring to a superficial emotion, but an act or effect of one's love for God, this joy that Paul exhorts is different from having a few moments of uplift that the world gives. I, I, I mean, I know I should not say this, but you know, you can roll your own cigarettes. <clears throat> Y'all know what I mean. The kind that you roll yourself. And uh, and they'll give you peace for a while. But you only float out there for a little while. And then you got to come on back down. Y'all don't get me. You know, you, you, you really can find some joy at the bottom of the Budweiser can. But uh, when you wake up in the morning, <clears throat> the joy that you got out the can will have dissipated over the night. Y'all ain't gonna help me like I want you to. And so Paul exhorts this, this message saying that this kind of kingdom of God joy is not like the joy that the world gives. Because the joy that the world gives only lasts for a moment. Help me Holy Ghost. Paul's joy may not make you laugh. L-A-U-G-H. But Paul's joy will make you last. L-A-S-T. Nehemiah chapter 8 records, he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. But this day is holy unto the Lord. Then he says, neither be ye sorry for the joy of the Lord is your strength. In other words, this joy that comes from God imparts a confidence that no matter what happens, you are to know, you are to trust, and you are to believe that nothing can separate us from the one who has made us who loves us and who has saved us. Paul could rejoice in jail because he had a good focus on life and particularly life in God. He knew that life and joy were more than the superficial moments that give us uplift only to be brought back down. And for the focus-minded Christian, Life and joy comes from a certain place, a certain personality, and a certain relationship. This Christian kind of joy comes from heaven, comes from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it comes from a loving, reciprocating relationship. Because just as God loves you, you got to learn to love God back. Yes. A few years for, before rather penning this letter to the Philippians, Paul wrote to the congregation in Rome and using a technique of rhetoric, asked the question, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Yes. Paul went on and asked them in his rhetorical uh, comments to them, he asked, Will hardship, will distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or perilous times, like pandemics, a sword? He goes on to say that nothing, y'all know how I like to say it, do He says, no thing shall separate us from the love of God. Yes. I've told you before that when he makes that statement that nothing shall separate us from the love of God, it's not so much about our tight grip on God. Y'all listen good now. But what Paul is talking about is you can have your hands dangling and life may have beat you so bad until you ain't got strength to hold on. But Paul wants to encourage the church to say, even if you can't hold on to God, God will hold on to you. 
That's why it says nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Paul knows that learning to focus on how much God loves us will change our lives. It'll change the dynamics of our lives. Focusing on God will prove that Christ is our life. Our reason for living. Our purpose for living. And to focus on Christ will help you live both better and it'll help you live longer. Because not only will you enjoy this life, but the scripture promises that if you learn to focus on God's joy, not only will you enjoy this life, but there's another life with an unending day that's coming. I know that it doesn't make sense to say that you can have joy in the midst of life's troubles. But there's a witness on this Facebook Live who knows that through Christ, yes, you can. I, I know that it doesn't make sense to say that you can have joy when death has broken your family circle and the dark night of the soul has come upon you. But there's a witness who knows that, oh, yes, you can. I, I know that it doesn't make sense to say that you can have joy in a world of sickness and poverty and pain and in the darkness of a pandemic. But there are some witnesses around the room who say, oh, yes, you can. It does not make sense to say that you can have joy when the issues and per per perplexities of this life have turned your life upside down. But I know there's a witness who will say, oh, yes, you can. So as I push this joy agenda in this season of Advent, as we are reminded that God is always near us, be ye reminded of a God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not have, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And in this season of joy, be reminded that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And be reminded that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what, Reverend? Saved from whatever you need to be saved from. Shaquita, rolling your own cigarettes, trying to find joy at the bottom of a can. Whatever you need to be saved from. Coronavirus. Omicron, however you say it, whatever you need to be saved from, the scripture says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul wants the church to know that no matter what you might be going through or what might be going through you, no matter what's got your burden down, there is a prescription for joy. And you can write it for yourself. And Paul says, here's how to write it. Here's how to bring joy into your life. Here's how to bring joy into your home. Here's how to bring joy into your family life. Paul says, write the prescription. Rejoice in the Lord. And don't let it be no phony rejoicing. But he says rejoice always. Oh, yeah. And again I say rejoice. Yeah. I've always looked side eye at church folk who can get happy at church. <laughs> but won't speak to you. Yes, at red and white. Uh, That's right. I shall be red and white. I, I, I've always gotten a little perturbed by church folk who can say hallelujah at church. Yeah. But will never out cuss you. On Monday, if you look at them wrong, Paul says, Rejoice! Are y'all helping me? And then he says, In the Lord. Not, not 
not not in your bank account. No, no. No, not 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 in your good looks. Not because you can afford to get your nails done, hands and toes, pity and many. No, that ain't what he's talking about rejoicing in. But Paul says rejoice in the Lord. Not because you got your hair did and you're looking some kind of good and you taking pictures of yourself and a good looking picture you posted on Facebook that makes you happy. No, Paul says rejoice in the Lord. Always. And then he said, let me say it again. Rejoice, I say, in the Lord. Let your moderation be known unto all men that the Lord is at hand. Yes. Be careful, full of care for no thing, but in everything, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known made to God. And listen, listen, I'm going to leave you alone because I'm done preaching. He says, and the peace of God. Yes. Did y'all hear me? Peace. This stuff is connected. Yes. You know, to folk, folk love the uh, uh, proof text, the, 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 the scriptures. Go in and pick out a verse that makes you feel good. But Paul has got this stuff connected. You can't get to that part until you get this part. This part is rejoice. In the Lord always. And again I said rejoice. And when you learn how to do that. Paul gets down to the seventh verse that says. And the peace of God. Right. Which passeth oh. All understanding. So all of those Negroes and Negrettes. That intentionally tried to get on your nerves. They'll look at you and say. Now I don't know what's wrong. But she ought to be upset. He ought to be upset because of the way I did her, the way I did him. They ought to be upset. But Paul says, no, if you learn to rejoice in the Lord always, the God, the God that we serve will give you a kind of peace that passes understanding. And God will keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Amen. So. You have a reason to rejoice. Yeah. And when you learn to live this joy agenda, you'll be able to say like the saints of old. Ha, ah, yeah, I remember growing up in Whiteville. Folk, uh, Christian folk, my cousins and aunties and others would be walking down the street, would be walking, they got no car, uh, 90 degrees in the summertime, walking out, walking down to the store to get a bag of grocery that they would have to carry back in their hands uh, and you could speak to them and they would speak by saying things like, I still have joy. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you think they were crazy. Uh, down in Hallsboro, around Whiteville, uh, poor folk ain't hardly got two red pennies to rub together to make two cents. You could speak to them and they wouldn't say hello. No, no, nobody said hello. Uh, no, nobody said hello. No, 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 no. They would say things like, I still have joy. Yeah. You say, hey, Miss Lucille, I still have joy. I still have joy. Yeah. After all the things I've been through. Yeah. yeah, I still have my joy. And then they would say things when we get to church on Sunday morning. They would say things. They'd sing songs like, this joy that I have. Yeah, they were talking about this kind of joy that Paul is preaching about. They say this joy that I have. Yes. They say the world didn't give it. Didn't give it. Yes. Yeah, and we would get happy in church. I was a little boy. I shout right along with them. I ain't know what I was shouting about. But the joy that they had yes. was like a cup that had overflowed, and I was down in the saucer. And when it would overflow, their joy would overflow. It'd give me joy. And I would shout along with them. I didn't know what I was shouting about. But they'd say, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it. And the world can't take it away. Maybe there's a witness in this house today who has that kind of joy. And you've determined in your mind that I'm going to rejoice in the Lord always. No matter what comes, no matter what or who gets in my way, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to have my joy. And you'll tell the devil that you can't steal my joy. This, my brothers and sisters, I've talked too long, is Paul's joy agenda. 
It's our joy and joy to rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah. Always. Again. But again, I say, yes. rejoice. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Some, some passages in Scripture you have to read through mm -hmm. its metaphorical meaning. But this passage is literal as Paul speaks to the church, those Christians in Philippi, and say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. It'll make a difference in your life. Maybe there's somebody in this room or on this, listening to this Facebook live broadcast who you haven't fully committed yourself to Christian discipleship. Hear me good. Listen to my words. You haven't fully committed yourself to Christian discipleship. And maybe I shouldn't say fully. You haven't committed yourself to Christian discipleship. All of us, none of us have fully committed ourselves. Mm -hmm. But you haven't committed, made the commitment to be a disciple of Christ. Mm. Meaning you're not committed to keeping Christ in your daily life. Praying, reading scripture, learning of him, allowing him to, his words, his words. When we read scripture, it is the voice of God speaking to us. Letting his words guide our life. Mm. We haven't made a commitment to allow his words to guide our life. My Lord. I'm inviting you to come. And that's metaphor for those, especially those who are watching my broadcast, but to come to Christ and give him your life. Amen. Make a commitment. Put God in Christ in the center of your life. Hear his words daily. Pray to him. Listen to him speak to you and allow him to guide your life. Maybe there's somebody in here who needs to make that commitment. That's what altar call and this invitation to Christian discipleship is about. I know we say join the church. Sometimes people don't understand that. They think that you're asking them to come be a member of a group of us who come and sit in this room once or twice a week or listen to prayer, Bible study, Sunday school. It's more to it than that. Yeah. What it is is to make a commitment to allow the words of Christ to shape and reshape and transform your life. This is an invitation to Christian discipleship. It's the same invitation that Christ gave the 12 who follows him. To come, he says, follow me, learn of me, take up my yoke and learn of me. This is the invitation that I make to you today. As the choir sings, I pray that you think about it. If you're listening on Facebook Live, type us a response. Say, I want to give my life to Christ. Oh, Lord. Give us a way to get in contact with you. The Christ is calling in this season of joy to give you a good reason to rejoice. As the choir sings.
mercy and peace, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Ghost, rest, rule, and abide with each of us from now, henceforth, and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, I pray. Amen. 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 I bless you all, Lord, peace. Thank you. Uh, before y'all, before y'all move too much, I think we have some visitors today. Uh, would y'all?